Please be seated. Now the enemy doesn't want us to hear God's word, but we're going to listen to it anyway. And so brothers and sisters, open your hearts and your ears to hear what God has to say to his people tonight. Good evening. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Our first reading tonight is from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, starting in verse 12. Very special time. This is the time when Israel was without law. The first set of tablets was broken, and the second one has not yet been created. And this is what happened. Then Moses said to the Lord, verse 12, See, to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also find, found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. You see, beforehand, God promised Moses he would send them the angel. Now Moses is negotiating. He wants more. And he said in verse 14, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. The Hebrew word for presence is panai, the face of God will go with you. And then he said to him, if your presence, if your panim does not go with us, do not bring us up from here, for how when will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, Please, show me your glory. Moses is something else. He just keeps asking, and I think God loves it. Show me your glory. And then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord Yahweh before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. And so it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. We need to consider that there's a real possibility that Moses, the servant of God, saw the back of Jesus on that day. Every scar, every wound, every drop of blood, and he understood. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening. Our second reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 through 7. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him 
and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel portion for tonight is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, the good news according to Matthew. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and so they left him and they went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Again. We pray by saying, or by telling the Lord that um, the maker of heaven and earth, we come and humble ourselves before you and before your word. And we pray that you will speak to each one of us in the way and in a voice that we need at this moment. We ask that uh, not one single person will leave without hearing you speak directly. And again, we pray that um, you would be mindful of the need, our needs. We ask that um, you will indeed strengthen us and give us that determination to be faithful, especially in the times in which we find ourselves. Amen. Last week we um, focused on the passage from Exodus, and I think all of the readings are quite appropriate for the events that are swirling around us. Um, and uh, 
They're equally, as they were last week, they're equally, I believe, relevant for us this week. And for those who were here last week, because surely uh, most of us at least have forgotten, you know, we all forget the sermon 10 or 15 minutes after the service. And for those who weren't here, we focused on Exodus chapter 32. This was the sin of the golden calf. Moses was up getting the details of the tabernacle. And uh, very quickly, folks began to um, lose heart or lose faith. And uh, they pressure Aaron to build them a golden calf. That golden calf uh, is referred to three times in, the, in chapters uh, 32 and 33 as uh, a great sin. And of course, there are um, some extremely serious consequences. And God is angry. He has done so much for his people and yet his people so quickly, so immediately lose confidence in him, lose faith in his promises and are up to their own devices. And in the passage that we read last week, God says to Moses, echoing the story of the flood, that the people are corrupt and that he is going to wipe them out and start over. And Moses, following in the tradition of Abraham, says, you can't do that, God. What about your promises? And so we talked about Moses and his very bold, tenacious, risky, you might say, even sacrificial intercession <clears throat> on behalf of the people. It wasn't arrogant. He wasn't out for personal gain. Okay, God, you can get rid of all those people. Just look after my family, look after my clan. They are a nuisance, by the way, and I'm getting tired of them. And the intercession was based on God's word. Yes, Moses reminds God of his promises. And it's Moses, it's his faithfulness that changes the course of history, you might say. Changes direction. And God spares his people. And that's more or less where we left it. What wasn't included in our reading was that Moses came down from the mountain and when he saw the revelry, which the Bible makes uh, strongly hints, was not just simply revelry, but it was uh, gross immorality amongst the people, he smashes the tablets of the law and it's as if he's saying, you, the people of Israel, you have broken or canceled the covenant. And so Moses not only intercedes, but now he must be the mediator, find, seek atonement for the people, which he does, and ultimately becomes the judge. And it's only then that Moses can come back down with two new sets of tablets. It's only then that the covenant can be renewed. But the covenant cannot be renewed until the sins of the people are forgiven and actually that there is judgment. And when we want to think of Jesus and the messianic task or the messianic mission, we might sometimes ask the question, well, why is forgiveness and forgiveness of sin so essential? What, why, does this, 
Why do we need this mediator? After all, we could just repent. And repentance, of course, is important. But it doesn't, go, doesn't necessarily go deep enough. So for there to be a renewed covenant or a new covenant, actually, I think the term renewed covenant is better. For the covenant to be, yes, reestablished and expanded as it is, yes, in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, <clears throat> there needs to be forgiveness of sins. But as we read in Matthew chapter 1, yes, forgiveness of sins, this might sound her like heresy, forgiveness of sins isn't perhaps enough. Yes, to say I'm forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven, it's the testimony that a lot of believers have. But forgiveness, and I'm sure I'll get a few letters, forgiveness, hate WhatsApps, isn't the end in itself, right? And again, Matthew chapter one just puts this very beautifully for us. Yes, and we will go back to Exodus in a moment. It tells, the angel appears to Mary, and it says that he's going to give birth to a son. His name is going to be Yeshua, Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. Wonderful. The messianic task. But then it goes on to say, okay, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Technically, Emmanuel isn't the name of Jesus, right? It's what he, it's who he is and what he does. And our sins are forgiven so that we can enter this renewed covenant, the renewed covenant that God makes with the, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and then ultimately with the whole world. But our sins are forgiven so that we can enter in and have fellowship with the living God through his son, Jesus, the Messiah. And, and as in one simple word, it's presence. It's presence. It's so that we can have access to the presence of the Lord and all the benefits, <coughs> right, that that brings with us. And so Moses, after being intercessor, mediator, judge, a type of Jesus, no doubt, Moses then, he doesn't, um, he's not going to give up. He's not going to stop uh, requesting things because he, he thinks, he probably thinks to himself, I'm on a roll here and I, I have a few other things to, to ask for. And again, they're not personal. And so in the next two chapters, Moses will ask, will have five requests and God will answer four and a half of them. Yes. And starting in chapter three, there's a tent of meeting. And uh, this tent of meeting is outside the camp and Moses goes to the tent of meeting and he speaks to God face to face. Well, this is not merely about geography or logistics. It's that, again, the sins of the people have been forgiven, but fellowship isn't fully restored. And the tabernacle, we may recall, was supposed to be in the center or in the midst of the people, not on the edge. But Moses goes and he speaks to God face to face, which is not to be taken literally in this case. He's speaking to God in such a way that he's receiving this revelation clearly. And then Moses has a few requests because the Lord's already said, now Moses, <clears throat> I'm, I'm good with you, things are, things are very, uh, our relationship is intact. 
Now I want you to lead these people into the promised land. And Moses, he is not quite so sure. It says, you've been telling me lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Here's Moses, maybe he's a shepherd. He has uh, thousands and thousands of people uh, under his care. He is supposed to lead them to some place he's never been before. How is he gonna get there? How is this logistically possible? What, what is the direction home? Who was going to protect the people and care for the people and provide for the people? So Moses is saying, you know, who, who will you send with me? He says, I know you by name and I and you have found favor, the Lord said, right? Um, oh, sorry, Moses quoting the Lord. I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you. And here there's a, it's a nice connection between what does it mean to know the Lord? To know the Lord is to know his ways to know his commandments, to know his character, and actually to live those out, right? It's not simply theological or theoretical Bible knowledge, as important as that may be. But oftentimes we stop by thinking, if I got the right doctrine, I somehow know the Lord. No. And then Moses says, I know you're finding favor with me, but remember, Lord, these are your people. Okay, and the Lord says, my, my presence, I think it literally says, my presence will go and I will give you rest. So the, the presence of the Lord is going to go with Moses, but that's not good enough for him. And Moses said, if your presence do not, does not go with us, if your presence doesn't go with the entire community, with the people, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? And here's the question that Moses poses to the Lord, and it's a question, I believe, that should be posed to us. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What's gonna make us different? What's gonna make us special? What's going to be us evidence of the covenant, yes, that we are a holy nation and a royal priest, right? A royal priesthood, I hope I don't have that backwards. And from Exodus chapter 19. How will anyone know? And the question for us as a Christian community is the same question. What distinguishes us from other communities, from other groups? Is it that we're Anglican? Which it suits me personally very nicely. I like following the Lord in the Anglican tradition. A lot of people don't. Is it that, uh, oh, we all believe in predestination or we're all united in some way doctrinally or we're all left-wing or all right-wing, we're all for Israel, we're all for the Palestinians, yeah? We, what distinguishes us? That we go to church on Sunday, some of us? that we say Jesus is Lord, which is a good start, but it's certainly not enough. Oh, we do good deeds, and churches do many, many wonderful things. But what makes us different than the Kiwanis Club or lots and lots of charities, for example, that exist in this country? And at the moment, it's, it is in some ways 
despite the tragedy in which we find ourselves, it's very heartening to see the way uh, people, citizens of this country, are uh, working together yes, uh, to help each other. You know, if it's not the presence of the Lord, if it's not the presence of the Lord, and in our case, the presence of Jesus, then we're indistinguishable from most other, com from all other com communities, yeah? And so, how many of us have a passion that the Lord truly will be present in our midst? Or how many of us make this a primary concern? And it's not just that the Lord is present with me, helping me with my struggles or my temptations or, you know, um, my blessings, whatever it may be. How many of us think about it in the way that God thinks about it, right? That God is always looking for a people and he wants to indwell or inhabit that people, not just a bunch of individuals here and there. And where do we see the presence of the Lord? And how has it manifested its, how does it manifest itself? Usually, and more often than not, and than not in the way that we relate to each other. In the way that we treat each other. In the way that we care for each other. which is, should be characterized by love and mercy and respect, but also can be characterized by a generous honesty. So the presence of the Lord. Now after reading the stories, or reading what happens in chapter 32 and 33 and even 34, we might think, you know, this God's a bit scary. I'm not sure I want to get too close. And you know, after talking with people over the years, I've come to the conclusion that many of us want to keep a quote unquote safe distance from the Lord. We want him involved just enough to bless us and to get us out of trouble when we <clears throat> need, you know, when we need some divine help or we find ourselves uh, in a mess. But we don't want him to interfere too much. We might be afraid of him. Or he might disrupt the nice thing I have going on. Or we might be frightened of him, I mean, he might punish me, or he might be angry with me. We may just be sort of indifferent, right? That uh, it doesn't, it's not a passion for us, right? Inviting him in to our lives and our community and doing those things, which for example, the book of Ephesians, um, chapter four and five, very helpful for setting a context in which the presence of the Lord thrives in our community. So what distinguishes us? What distinguishes us from something, from others? And I'll tell you, in the last 200 years, the way our society now works, at least most of Western society, folks, most people, no longer ask whether our religion is true or our theology is true. You know what the question, you know what the overwhelming question that most people have on their minds is what effect does all this Jesus stuff have? 
Or what does Jesus do? Yes, what difference does it make? What difference does it make? That's the witness, yes. And that's Moses. I'm, we're not setting out from here unless you, you go with me, unless you go with us. And that question, by the way, very ironically, Moses himself, he struggles with that in chapter 3 of Exodus. God says, go to Pharaoh. He says, uh-uh, I'm not going. I'm not a talker. And you know, the Lord finally convinces him, takes a little arm twisting. But the Lord promises him and says, I will go with you. Does he not? And whenever God's tr people are in trouble, or wherever God, whenever God's people find themselves confused or challenged over and over and over again, you can do your own Bible study. Yes, whether it's Isaac returning from Egypt, Jacob uh, being scared of Esau, Joshua assuming the leadership from Moses, whether it's Barak uh, you know, going to fight uh, Sierra, whether it's Saul or David or Jeremiah, God is saying, I will go with you. I will, I want to reassure you where you're going or what the, the thing that you have to do or the places where you have to walk. They may be difficult, but I will go with you. I will go with you. This is um, God is always, right? always with his people. And Moses is just simply, again, reminding God, God, this is what you've done in the past. You can't desert us, or you can't let us down now. And then Moses has another question, another request. And this request is pretty cheeky. And, God, and then Moses says to God, let me see your glory. Let me see who you really are. I want to see your face. And here I think Moses is actually asking to see God's face. But we might think, no, wait a minute, God doesn't have a face. This is, he's a spirit, it's somehow metaphorical. But many places in the scripture, God often takes a human form. And maybe God has a body something like ours. And uh, this body may not be made of the same flesh and blood like we have. It's not a corruptible body. It's a body that perhaps it's a thousand nuclear reactors exploding at one time. And Moses says, I want to see your glory, meaning I want to see, yeah, who you really are. Show me. Now, we might think, ah, here comes the fireworks, the light show, the lasers, yes, the 150 tons of sound equipment. Right, so we can have the God spectacular. God will show all his glory and his power and how big and he, he is. And what does God do? God warns Moses, again, you can't see my face and live. You cannot see my face and live. But I'll show you my glory. And glory is nothing more than holiness uncovered. Glory is the tangible, concrete evidence of God's holiness, of God's character. And 
God passes by Moses, and what does he say? He tells Moses in the chapter, he says, I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And then he goes on to say in the next chapter, when passing in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to a thousand, to thousands, and probably the understanding, maintaining love to thousands of generations, thousands of generations, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. And again, Moses, when he hears this, says, okay, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, we read these passages like this and we think, oh yes, those Israelites, and even today, the descendants of the Israelites, those modern Jews, yes, they're stubborn and stiff-necked. No more stubborn and stiff-necked than we have been as Christians over the ages. No more disobedient or unfaithful than we have been. No more sinful than we have been. And again, if we live in glass houses, we should be very careful about throwing stones at other people. We should first and foremost read this about ourselves, that despite our unfaithfulness and to despite our many, many mistakes and the way that we have been broken covenant, the covenant that's made in the blood of Jesus, God indeed punishes the church, oftentimes through public humiliation but he will always reform and regather and renew just as he does with the people of Israel. People of Israel will break the covenant and God will oftentimes discipline or bring punishment, but there there will be no divorce. And just as there will be, Jesus will not divorce the church. Even though We've done some horrible things. And by the way, at the same time, we've done some wonderful things. We've done some wonderful things. So we need to be careful in the way that, in the way that we judge ourselves. So we talk about the presence of the Lord and maybe being afraid or maybe being hesitant. How can we be hesitant with someone who says, I'm going to have mercy on thousands of generations who love me? Right? How can we be hesitant about, with someone who says he's slow to anger, abounding in love, full of faithfulness? Yes. We should be grateful that God is other and different because he loves us and is merciful to us and compassionate with, to us in a way that no other human being yes, could do so. And finally, you know, the same God that accompanies the people of Israel into the Holy Land, yes, it's the same God, yes, has been with his people down through the ages. And it's the God who's present with us as believers in Jesus the Messiah. And this year we've been reading Matthew's Gospel. We're about to come to an end in the next few weeks. But the focus of Matthew's gospel is always this, which you can't see, <clears throat> but it's Emmanuel. It's about a Messiah who's present with his people. And over and over again, 
the gospel is telling us, yes, that Jesus goes with us. Yes, that Jesus is amongst us. And it happens, as we, when we read in the beginning, it starts with the forgiveness of sins. But it also, yes, there are many promises. And some of those promises include that when we receive children or those who might be small or weak or insignificant, you know, Jesus says, it's as if you receive me. Or in the same chapter of Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name. By the way, it's the most misquoted or most abused verse in the Bible. Why are two or three gathered in the name of Jesus in that context? context? In order to bring reconciliation and to end division in a community. Because division and infighting and gossiping and backbiting and backstabbing, right? And a refusal to get along. All of that drives God's presence out of it or minimizes God's presence in a community. Where is Jesus Emmanuel? Where we're working for reconciliation and unity. When we come to the Lord's table, Matthew's Gospel, yes, Jesus is present at that table and we commune with the Lord, yes. When we meet those who are hungry or poor or refugees or, are, we, or who are imprisoned, Yes, God is with us in Jesus the Messiah. So we might say, oh, the most obvious, when we're out making disciples, yes, teaching people how to follow and to imitate Jesus. Yes, Jesus says, I will never forsake you or leave you. So we might be like Moses, you know, who, me? Wait a minute. Moses was at the burning bush where Moses says, uh-uh, I'm not going anywhere. The world is confusing. confusing. We don't know what to do. Uh, we don't know how to respond to such evil and wickedness necessarily. But the Lord is with us. Jesus is, a, God is Emmanuel through his son, Jesus. And he's all given us a task to do. And it's as, as we do that task, those, those things that he has asked us to do, not only do we come to a deeper and more intimate knowledge of the Lord, and again, remember what Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And my Father and I will come and make our home in you. Yes. But it's also that, as Moses asked, yes, I want to see your glory. Then when we are obedient, again, follow after Jesus, then the world, yes, sees sees the glory of God. Jesus himself, yes, Jesus himself is in a human face, the glory of God. And in John 17, 22, he says, I share that glory with you. I share that glory with you. And so at the end of Matthew 5, it says, may your good works shine before men so that when the world sees, yes, our obedience to Jesus, they'll glorify God in heaven. Or 1 Peter chapter 2, yes. He says the following, yes. Just as 
Exodus 19 declares about Israel. Peter says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, you were not a community, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against the soul. Live such, a, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Amen. During these days, these days of, again, horror and death, and at a time when things might even get worse than they are now, let's be determined to be a people who practice the presence of the Lord, who have an awe for God's holiness, and who want to make a difference, yes, with those around us who are suffering. Lord, we pray again that you would help us at this time. We ask that we would be light and salt, and that not only would we be interceding in a and and bold and passionate and sacrificial ways, but that you will give us many opportunities to let our light shine at this time, and that despite the evil, you you would be lifted up, and that your name would be sanctified amongst all those who live in this country. Amen.